Everybody hear me? We're good? All right, okay, cool. So before we get started, so first, my name's Greg. I'm director of product for LWC, LWR, and some back-end services. Before we get started, I gotta prove to my boss I'm doing this. So I'm gonna get a quick shot with you all, all right? Everybody game? I want like super professional, no, screw it, whatever. All right, one, two, three, cheese. All right, cool. All right, have a good day. I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. All right, so thank you so much for taking the time. It's a privilege to have you guys here, be here in person, hear how you all are using LWC or you're moving to LWC. I'm super stoked to talk about some of the work we've been doing that maybe a lot of times is kind of behind the scenes, but also outline for you all how you all can actually get engaged with it. Like it's things that we're doing, but how you can potentially harness us to help push things forward on the web platform uh, for the betterment not only of LWC, but for your own customers and your own end users. Prior to that, I want everybody to take a minute and read this slide. I'm joking. Don't make purchasing decisions based on what I'm about to show you. Uh, you've heard it probably 90 times since you've been here, so I won't repeat it, but here's my legal slide. So first, let's take a trip down memory lane. So uh, why did we build LWC? LWC was introduced over three years ago. It's had wonderful traction, and over 22 million LWC components have been created. You use them every single day. Uh, I'm sure many of you are still creating them. We continue to see that line go up. One of our wonderful engineers is in the front row here. We continue to see that number go up, which is great. Um, so thank you so much for using it. But it's important to kind of think about why did we go build it? Uh, it was actually when I first joined, I've almost been here two years ago, it was one of the very first questions I asked. Because I came from prior working basically as an in the, within the web industry, and it was kind of like, why do we need yet another framework, right? Like we kind of all use other frameworks, why do we need yet another one? Uh, so it was one of the questions that I went and asked. Uh, and one of the key, key reasons that we went and built it out for is that, hey, we wanted to work with web standards. We wanted to be like, we wanted to kind of, we learned from Aura, we learned from Visual Force. We wanted to lean into where the web platform was going and start working and innovating with web standards. A lot of things I actually came from working on a browser prior to this. Um, I won't name any names, Edge. Um, but basically helping see that through, through, move forward through to Chromium was just super powerful. And it's one of those things, once you work on one, you intimately understand actually how much optimizations and benefits that you can bring working on the engine. So if you're able to lean into that web platform, as much as possible and align with it, the, the capabilities for improved security, trust, basically think everything that we prioritize becomes available to you. And so that was one of the key benefits of us moving to web standards was leaning into the thing that we render every day. Out of curiosity, from a day to day, how many of you all open Salesforce on a browser? Just real quick. Okay, so cool, so this is worth us doing. Okay, cool, awesome. <laughs> so. The second one is engineer for performance. We got a lot of feedback during the Aura days, Visual Force days. Uh, while some of the capabilities were super awesome, ultimately those same capabilities would ultimately end up with a negative performance benefit, uh, performance hindrance to the end user. So whether they're on B2C commerce, whether they're uh, using uh, sales and service, whether it's uh, actually a full end user or you're just try doing your day to day, that performance can be so painful. <laughs> when you're having to wait for things to load, when you're just wanting to click. Uh, it always reminds me of those sitcoms where you see them at the airport and they're sitting there typing forever. And you're just like, hey, I wanna change my flight. And they're just typing, 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 typing. Anything that we can do to improve their performance greatly improves the uh, user experience. And last but certainly not least, we want to be able to help customers slowly transition uh, away from or over to LWC. So they have this modern developer experience. They have uh, this great performance and able to lean into us working with the web platform and the standards in order to provide uh, great benefits. But also we need to be able to ensure that when we go and release this framework. So we looked at other frameworks. We need to be able to provide the trust that you all depend on. We need to be able to ensure backwards compatibility, have it work with Aura. We didn't want to just have a cliff where it was like, hey, y'all, we're moving forward to the future. Have a nice life. All of your stuff is broken. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to be able to do responsible rollouts. We'll hit on that a little bit later as well. So ultimately, to sum this up, we wanted to work with the web platform, not against it. So even if you're opening the mobile application, within there, you're going to be getting web views. So it doesn't matter if you're on mobile, doesn't matter if you're on desktop. Ultimately, you're gonna be working with the web platform in some form. The LWC components you're creating are gonna be rendering in numerous different places. So ultimately, we wanna push the web forward for our Salesforce customers and ultimately our shared users. So whether, again, like I said, they're actual customers or they're end users working in sales and service, we wanna push it forward and we do this in a variety of ways. We'll be covering browser breaking changes that have occurred and how we've worked with different browser vendors. 
uh, testing early and responsible migrations uh, for upcoming standards recommendations, as well as actually taking things that we started at Salesforce and saying, hey, actually the entire web industry needs this. Let's standardize, help get it implemented, and ship it in browsers. So we work closely, this is how we go about doing it. We work closely with TC39, who they basically, ECMAScript, they put together the JavaScript language. We have uh, um, delegates there that help push standards and uh, uh, different APIs forward there. The W3C, I don't know how many people are familiar with the W3C, but basically every standard, if it's like uh, CSS, the privacy working group, we have people involved in all kinds of different of uh, the community groups and working groups there, uh, pushing things forward. What we G owns the HTML specification, so we're engaged there as well, uh, which kind of makes sense when we work with web components. We're heavily engaged in the web components community group and the working group there. Um, and then also, and this can't be understated enough, we have great relationships with all the major browser vendors, uh, working with them as things come out. So this is where I kind of wanted to take a second. Leverage us if you can. If you hit issues, don't necessarily just assume, oh, hey, the new release came out of Chrome and Salesforce has gotten slow. Crap, that sucks. It's like, no, we have this, this, these relationships. Please, by all means, go file a bug on Chrome, but also let us know about it. Or let us know about it, and we can help facilitate improving those. And we'll hit on some of the scenarios where we've actually, we've actually done this work uh, so you can kind of see how that benefits. So we'll start off with browser breaking changes. So in the HTML specification, has anybody used like the alert command in JavaScript? Anybody? All right, OK. Some, some heading nods heading. Uh, Salesforce is an interesting platform. We'll get in a little bit how we're a little bit unique to most websites. But basically, the HTML specification landed a change where they were going to deprecate window.alert, confirm, and prompt in third-party context. And in Chrome 96, they shipped that change. We had over 400 cases created in less than four days. Over 1,000, maybe some of you are in this room, over 1,000 customers known issues on that. We basically spun up a V-team, went quickly like into like SWAT team mode, kind of like what happened, what changed, because I don't know about you all, like browser vendors mean well, but they have like thousands of change happening every single week. So everybody keeping up on every single change is actually really, really, really complex. Uh, but ultimately, this had a massive breaking change on us. So we spun into high gear. We got on calls with uh, the Chromium team and, like, to start. We basically got on with Chrome, uh, Microsoft. As I said, what happened? And they were like, oh, a spec change happened. It landed in Chrome 96. We were like, get rid of it, revert it. Here's why. Here's, here's how you're impacting Salesforce. A thing coming from working on a browser, it's important to understand that we, they do have telemetry, but enterprise software is a black box because they unfortunately don't get that telemetry phoned home like they would from like your normal consumer. So a lot of the utilization is transparent to them. So they made a call the best they could, unfortunately missed us. We actually have done a retro with them as well as the technical architecture group. Um, and different vendors on basically how can we ensure that when deprecations are happening, they're reaching out to a centralized, like, think committee of sorts of kind of like, hey, are you going to be impacted? Let's not only just get that quantitative insight, but also the qualitative insight in order to make these shipping changes happen. So ultimately what they did, Chrome reverted it like the following week. Like, so it, it, had, it was removed. We were able to remove the banner of, hey, there's a breaking change. Uh, we likewise worked with uh, Apple. They had gotten it into iOS 15. Uh, we were able to work with them quick enough, luckily enough, that they were able to do a patch, kind of a rush patch. So in 15.1, that was removed as well. Um, so if you actually go look, at it, it was one of those things that was an enlightening moment. If you go look at WebKit, it was like, revert, this broke Salesforce. <laughs> That's basically what it says. So it's like, so please, if you see those issues, hit us up. This is where I'm actually super thrilled with what the team did. Basically, we, we always want to, like, the reason they were getting rid of it is a completely valid reason. There are potential security concerns in other scenarios. Salesforce happens to live in third-party context, so it's not a security concern for Salesforce or the Salesforce platform itself. So in the scenarios we were breaking, it's not a security problem. But in other scenarios, you could potentially see it being hijacked for the user. So the reason they were wanting to deprecate it makes sense. So what we did is said, hey, base components, can you guys come up with a solution so that everybody can migrate? We can say, hey, unfortunately, we can't tell you for sure when or whether or not your window.alert, if you're using it in a LWC, would break or not, uh, or an aura or visual force. But ultimately, we were like, can you produce a base component that will work with all of Lightning? Uh, please go produce them. So we have three new ones coming out this summer 22. Well, I highly recommend if you're using window.alert on Salesforce anywhere, go leverage these. And the way in which to leverage them it's relatively simple. You were doing it this way. Now you're just going to use lightning.alert, lightningalert.open, 
And so this will basically do the invocation that you were expecting. This will leverage that base component. So you'll ultimately be able to do similar to what your alert or confirm or prompt. Again, there's three different ones that already cover this. Uh, so that you don't have to try to picture, grab this code. I have this wonderful QR code. I'll save this one here for a second for allow you guys to take pictures of. Uh, where we go over everything that I kind of just talked about. It's a blog post. It also covers Visual Force and Canvas as well. So just in case you're on older stuff, we likewise show you how to like, deal with this uh, scenario coming down. Because while the, the browser vendors have put this change on hold indefinitely, they kind of are waiting for us to give them the green light. So we kind of have said, hey, allow our, our developers to go make their changes, update, and then we'll come back to you. We'll watch the telemetry of these events kind of go up. And hopefully, we'll be able to come back to you and say, hey, let's say early 2023, go ahead and ship that change. So they're kind of looking, they're looking to you all to say, hey, are we safe? Are we good to go? So uh, help us move that forward. Another scenario that happened, very minor change. Uh, Chromium was doing some, uh, some work in accessibility. They shipped a change that they were, again, trying to improve the browser, make things great. Uh, Salesforce has a very complex DOM structure, very, very, very complex. And what happened was when they started rolling this out in their Finch trials, which basically think they start increasing the number of users uh, having access to this new accessibility uh, code modifications that they were making, literally just switching the tabs went from sub-second to six seconds. So like again, let's remember like the typing on the keyboard, the wonderful scenarios. We don't want to slow down that time that you're working with a customer in order to like make opportunities and leads. This is detrimental. Like within like we we had cases filed on us. We additionally we found these. Uh, the, luckily, some of you all maybe you're in the room when filed Chromium bugs actually on this. Um, and so we actually worked very 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 closely. One of our engineers on the performance team worked super closely with uh, them to basically give them access to. Salesforce orgs in order to be able to reproduce, not, not your orgs, dev scratch orgs. <laughs> dev scratch orgs, I should probably clarify that. Dev scratch orgs in order for us to actually be able to reproduce this, to be able to reduce the scenario, they were able to get a, a patch fix it in in order to like rectify the problem, but they're also working on a complete rewrite of the thing that they did for the long-term solution because basically the complexity of the DOM they hadn't taken into account with their change. So our DOM structure is rather complex. So they, they now have a test case to run against us, basically, to ensure that they no longer regress Salesforce with this new accessibility change that they're doing. Testing early uh, for responsible migrations. So cool, we just noticed the fires that can happen, right? That's kind of thinking after the fact, unfortunately. Like, things happen, software below us moves, it shifts, we need to move forward. Um, so ultimately, we also need to do responsible migration. One way in which we're doing this is with mixed shadow mode. So I actually stole this slide from PM's talk, so I appreciate you putting it together. Um, basically, when we first introduced LWC, native shadow DOM support was like nowhere to be found. Um, so we had a polyfill for it. We call it synthetic shadow DOM. But hey, look at all these green checkboxes down below. Isn't that great? So what we need to be able to do, though, is start, like again, we want to lean into the web platform. We don't want to just constantly duplicate it. And so because of that, we're introducing a new feature called LWC mixed mode. Uh, and basically, it's a new property that you put on your, your web component called shadow support mode equals any. Um, it will be in dev preview this uh, summer. Um, so by all means, get in contact with me if you want to get that, that enabled and take it for a test drive. Uh, basically, what happens is you, like, here's our LWC component. We've added that static property down there. And what ends up happening is that now you can see Within here, we actually have the, if you're looking at dev tools, if you're looking at used, used to looking at dev tools, you'll notice that we actually have a shadow root for our component. Rather than normally, you wouldn't actually see that shadow root within the dev tools because of the fact that we're actually using synthetic shadow to basically uh, pretend as though we're native shadow. This is, this is very powerful and I highly recommend like as we continue to roll it out, start migrating your components in this direction because it gives you access to like the scope to CSS uh, uh, pseudo elements, the part pseudo, uh, pseudo class, all these different capabilities that like we're not gonna keep implementing the polyfills now that there is complete support for those. So we're gonna slowly start migrating off of synthetic shadow over time. Very similar to Aura with LWC, we'll do a slow transition there but I highly recommend uh, getting involved in that. And then finally, driving Salesforce innovation into the web platform. How many of the folks here know about Lightning Web Security? Some of us. Locker. Have you heard of Locker? OK, more people with Locker. Gotcha. OK, so basically, one of the things that we want to be able to do is we want to be able to say, hey, browser vendors can normally do things more performant in their lands because of the fact they're closer to the metal than user land. Lightning Web Security is amazing, but we do a lot of stuff that the browser actually already has built into this. And this is something called Realms. 
And so if anybody understands how like global scopes work, uh, basically L LWS does a lot of work of making sure that these different realms, different documents, uh, basically we ensure the integrity as well as security of between those different components on the same page. So to like give you a visual representation, we've coined a term, it may suck, let me know if you have a better one, but Salesforce is unique in the fact that extensible, we are effectively an extensible web application. We're a web application where technically we have components that we built, that we ship, that we own, that we've decided to go deploy out. Additionally, you may go author components that you've built, you've created, you've deployed to org, you trust, right? And then finally, you may, hypothetically speaking, have gone to the App Exchange and grabbed this component and deployed it. So technically, we have three different, like, different types of trusted users with different capabilities that you want to ensure. Maybe you do want the App Exchange content to be able to have access to sensitive data. Maybe you don't. That's where Lightning Web Security becomes very powerful. But it also comes with some performance costs. So while it's great for security, it unfortunately doesn't uh, isn't the best path that we could take. And knowing that the browsers have this under the hood, we went to TC39 and helped specify something called Shadow Realms. And over the past year, super excited, we partnered with Agalia and sponsored the funding of the implementation of Shadow Realms. It is actually in the Safari Tech Preview now, so it should be the next upcoming release of Safari. We'll have it built in by default. Uh, so Shadow Realms, so, and Lightning Web Security is already set up for this. So if it recognizes that Shadow Realms is there, then, then we go leverage it. If we're also working with Agalia to help land the PR that is currently open for Shadow Realms in Chromium. And just check this out. Just preliminary testing on the tech preview, we noticed that up to 13x faster for initialization of performance when working with the technology preview. So what, what is that initialization? Basically, when you effectively go bootstrap up Lightning Web Security, uh, with an iframe using Shadow Realms versus Lightning Web. So when we take it in more of a realistic scenario uh, of basically having 100 namespaces with the Lightning Web Security running, it's up to eight times faster. So again, it's one of those things like we don't solely focus on just Salesforce code. We can be thinking about the entire vertical stack that we're running on. And so that's the benefit of us starting to think outside of the box of just Salesforce code or even you all just optimizing on your LWC components. If you're doing something and you're constantly hitting a wall and whether it's on the Salesforce platform or not, hit us up. Maybe that's an opportunity that we could be working on a feature in like, I don't know, whatever scenario that you're in that we could go drive into the web platform to ultimately push the web forward for the betterment of all of us together. So in the spirit of pushing the web forward, I'm, I'm going to try to like take in your all's reactions here to, as my first test here. January 1st, 2023, we'll be ending IE11 support from the platform side of things. Lex has not supported IE11 um, up until this point, but we have done work on the platform side to do some transpilation and capabilities for IE11. That will be ending for the spring 23 release, basically January 1st, 2023, so you wouldn't expect to see any type of changes up until that point. Uh, but we do want to start getting this out there. Hit me up if you have any questions, concerns, or thoughts on that. Um, super, super excited. There's a lot of great other LWC-related sessions. I highly take a, I recommend taking a look at it. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, happy to chat. I hope you all found this uh, useful, helpful. Uh, please go update your window.alert confirms prompts, because ultimately, at some point, I'm going to have to tell the browser vendors that they can chip their code. Uh, so please do that, and thank you all so much for coming out.